All right, we're recording, we're live, we're ready to go. Get all the Zoom stuff out of the way. Make sure that works, but not giving away anything. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming to this kind of penultimate session of the Democracy Summit. So my name is Dr. Benny Paglioni. I'm an assistant professor in systems engineering. And today we'll be talking about risk, what it is, how we perceive it, how we communicate it, and what it has to do with democracy. This isn't really a talk on democracy being at risk. So if you're here for that, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, although the keynote after this by Dr. Robert Putnam will probably scratch that itch a lot better than I could. Uh, so I'd like to start with a bit of an opening gambit. Which do you think, and this is only talking about radiation, which do you think is a riskier proposition? Living within 50 miles of an operating nuclear power plant or living here in Fort Collins? And I will call on people, so if I don't get a volunteer, I'm going to call on someone. But what do you think is riskier regarding radiation? Yes, in the back. Colorado, you're, you're not much filtering. You know, exactly, truck. exactly. Colorado. Colorado is far riskier from a radiological perspective than living near a nuclear power plant. Uh, and this kind of points to our some of our misconceptions about risk, right? A lot of us would look at a nuclear power plant and say, there's no way I'm living there. And I would agree, right? I would much rather live here. Uh, than next to, say, a nuclear power plant, even back in my home state of Georgia. Uh, but this kind of opens the stage to talk more about risk. And let's start with what risk really means, right? How would you define risk to someone who had never heard that term? What would you say to them? Any volunteers? Uh, kid who just came in, what would you define risk as? He's my student, so I can do this. <laughs> yeah. Um, as, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's risk of it. Um, Master's on the line. No, no there's a different, um, different things that could happen to something given certain circumstances. Okay, you got it about half right. And I actually expected most people to get the other half. Right, risk is a bad thing. Risk is some loss, but it's not just a bad thing, right? If you have something bad that you know for sure is going to happen, that's not really a risk. That's just a bad day, right? So risk really requires two major aspects that are the possibility of a loss and uncertainty, right? It has to be a possibility, not a certainty. Uh, and we as academics and as uh, risk experts use three questions that are called the risk triplet to define what risk is. It starts with a scenario, right? What can actually go wrong? Uh, and what is the likelihood of that happening? And finally, what are the consequences, right? What happens if this risk gets uncovered? Uh, and so that's kind of risk as an academic or maybe even a utilitarian construct, but it begs the question, why should we, as everyday people, care about risks? Well, we engage in risky activities every single day. As we pointed out earlier, living in Colorado, is an inherently risky proposition, right? We're doubling our average exposure compared to the rest of the US. Maybe you drove here today, that's incredibly risky. Maybe you had your car drive you here today, that's a possibility now. The jury's still out as to whether that's better than driving yourself. Uh, but we all engage in risky activities every day. Even sitting in this room, we're relying on an electric power distribution system that infuse our environment with certain risks. Uh, as well as you know, water distribution, healthcare, et cetera, all of these critical infrastructures come with risks. This is the last time I'll, I'll ask for your participation on a, on a quiz, uh, but let's take a look at some activities or technologies. This is pulled from a selection of 30 uh, that have all been ranked by the public as to which they think are riskier and ranked by the experts as to which they think are riskier. And we have alcohol, handguns, motorcycles, motor vehicles, nuclear power, uh, police work, aviation, and smoking. And so which of these do you think would be the riskiest? Uh, and I'd ask you in general, right? If you don't smoke, that doesn't change how risky smoking is. 
And so in general, which would you say is the riskiest thing here? Yes. Motor vehicles. Motor vehicles. Okay. Survey says uh not quite. Not uh, actually, oh sorry, motor vehicles. Yes, yes. I'm looking at motorcycles, but motor vehicles, yeah, you're exactly in line with the experts. And actually, that's one where the public does reasonably well compared to the experts. But we can see that there is a significant misalignment between how we think about risks and how the public act or how experts actually assess risks. And right away, we can see two key factors here, one being familiarity with the technology. Our understanding of something is pretty related to how risky we think that thing is. And the second uh, is that risks associated with direct benefits are generally more acceptable to the public, right? Something that we use, that we see the benefits from, those are the things we like. Nuclear power, we don't necessarily see the benefits from that, and so we get a little bit scared. Uh, and we get more scared when we realize we have no idea how that actually works, right? I mean, some of us do, but not all of us. Uh, and so let's take a look at what's actually going on, right? This disconnect between how we analyze risks and how we as people perceive risks. Uh, and for this, we'll turn to what's called the psychometric theory of risk perception that really aims to predict our perception based on characteristics of the risk object, right? The thing that we're worried about, uh, as well as characteristics of ourselves, right? And so when it comes to public risk perception, we are really more concerned as people with what I'll call like esoteric characteristics of the risk. This includes the dread that can be associated with certain consequences, right? We consider generally that a you know violent death is worse than dying in your sleep. At the end of the day, the consequence is still the same, but we dread a violent death far more than dying of natural causes. Similarly, we might have an aversion to this idea of tampering with nature, right? That Nature has a specific order dictated by God or the universe or, or whomever or whatever. And we as people shouldn't be messing with that, right? And that is kind of the genesis of this, this uh, debates over things like stem cell research, right? We're tampering with the natural order of things. Uh, we as people also generally concerned with fairness, right? So when the people experiencing the negative consequences from a risky enterprise and the people experiencing the benefits aren't the same, we have a pretty good sense that something is unfair there. Uh, we can round this out with things like our trust in the institutions that are safeguarding that risk, right? We trust our doctors with nuclear medicine, so we know our doctors. We don't trust our local nuclear engineer with a nuclear power plant, because we might not know those people, right? We probably don't trust the utilities as much as we trust our doctors. And so here, our perception is really based on the risk object and our own personality. But when we look at what we're doing to actually analyze risks in an expert setting, none of that is taken into a, to account, right? All we look at are the probabilities and the consequences. The risk is really determined only by those hard and measurable aspects of the risk object, right? And if you've read any of Daniel Kahneman's work, on behavioral economics, you might start to recognize some of the things, some of these as this idea of system one, rapid and intuitive but error prone thinking on the part of the public, and system two, that kind of slower, more deliberative mode of thinking on the part of the experts. And that's partially right. And we'll talk a little bit about how we think about risks. And we do that using heuristics that are kind of mental shortcuts that we take automatically to narrow our decision landscape, and biases, which are systematic errors in the way we think about things, right? So when we look at heuristics, these are those automatic shortcuts. Our brain is saying, there's a lot of information that's coming in through all of our senses. I can't, I don't have the computational power to deal with all that, so I'm gonna take some shortcuts, right? And the way we do that are we just kind of assume that memorable events are more likely. Makes a lot of sense, I remembered it for a reason. Uh, and it's generally good wisdom until you get into this era of constant media attention and immediate media attention on usually bad things that are probably not actually all that common. Similarly, we can all we also rely more heavily on our preconceived ideas and mental models of a situation rather than any actual data. 
That's called the representative heuristic, and it does lead to things like stereotyping. Uh, on the biases side, right, the systematic errors in thinking, uh, the gambler's fallacy is a pretty big one, right? You're sitting at the roulette table, red, red, red. The next one's got to be black. All on black comes up red, and you go home sad. Or it's red, red, red. You think, well, that's a pattern. Next one's got to be red, comes up black. You still go home sad, right? So that's one systematic error in how we think, right? Sometimes things are just random, and we as people are really bad at conceptualizing what random events actually are. Uh, similarly, we often uh, overemphasize kind of our first presentation of an issue or a person, why to some degree, first impressions kind of do matter if you're priming that person uh, for their perception of you. Uh, and lastly, we tend to take a very narrow view of our situations. Again, we don't really have a choice there's so much data that we have access to through our senses uh, that we really can't use all of it. So we use these heuristics and biases to give ourselves a shot, essentially, at actually making a decision. Right, and so that's the individual level. But when we look at the scale of communities and populations, it becomes a little bit trickier, right? I'm not you, you're not me. We probably have different perceptions of risk, but we can still come to some agreement on what risks are acceptable to the public and why. And it turns out that acceptable risks are dependent on a couple of different things. Again, the benefits of the activity, right? More benefits, more acceptable, makes a lot of sense. Uh, the voluntary nature of the risk, if we are assuming a risk voluntarily, like going skiing or going climbing, we're usually way more accepting of that then a risk that's involuntary, right? Someone puts a coal power plant in our backyard. Not too many people would be a fan of that. Again, the consequence distribution comes into play here with things like not in my backyarders or NIMBYism. Right? We all want electric power. We don't all want power plants where we can see them or even wind turbines where we can see them. Uh, so we say, well, this is great. This is a great idea. I love what you're doing here, but I would love it even more if you did it over there where I don't have to deal with it, right? Uh, again, the personal versus societal effect of the risk, right? Societal risks generally give rise to this idea that I as an individual can avoid it, right? And we saw this with COVID. It was a huge societal risk and we probably all know people who went out and said, well, I don't have to worry about that because I have you know, special genes or I, I made my own mask and it's totally fine, whatever the case may be, right? They thought that they could avoid that risk. And I bet that you found out they were probably wrong about that. Finally, uh, the frequency with which these risks occur has a lot to do with how we think about them. We all prefer many low consequence incidents like car accidents to even fewer very high consequence accidents like airplane crashes, although they seem to be getting uh, less and less rare these days. Uh, although it's still worth noting that they're an incredibly rare event, right? Planes do not crash every single day, even if you're looking at the news and you might think otherwise. Uh, and finally, having some level of personal control generally makes a risk feel more acceptable, right? Who likes driving on road trips? being the driver, right? Who likes riding in a car on road trips? Exactly. All right, maybe some of us do because it's, you know, it's a good way to, to power down, take a nap. I fall asleep immediately, my wife hates it. Um, but some level of personal control makes a risk feel more acceptable to us. And that's great, right? We have this personal perception of risk. We have this community level perception of risk. But how do we know when safe is safe enough, right? If I'm asking anyone in this room individually, we'll probably come to a bunch of different answers. And the way, uh, and basically by doing that and by having some experiments and uh, uh, experience with risk, we've been able to identify some generalities on when risks are acceptable to the general public. And what we see is that generally, activities associated with a fatality risk, the risk of dying, greater than one in 1,000 per year are completely unacceptable to the general public, uh, with one glaring exception. 
and that is motor vehicles. Cars are incredibly dangerous. Uh, and I say this as someone who is going to drive home tonight, it, they're insanely risky. And yet we all engage in that behavior every single day for the most part. Uh, in the United States, we don't necessarily have a choice, right? We don't have great uh, transportation in, or public transit infrastructure. So, and our cities are so spread out. So we're oftentimes kind of necessitated to have a car, but it doesn't change the risk value. And as we see that fatality risk kind of decreasing, risks get gradually more acceptable to people. Until we get to one in a million chance of dying or lower per year, at which point we're pretty much unaware that that risk even exists, right? That's uh, these things like act of God level risks, like being struck by lightning. Right? None of us really think about that because it just doesn't happen. Uh, and then, of course, once it does happen, you know, you end up being pretty surprised that you were struck by lightning, as most people who are struck by lightning are. And so what this all means is that for a lot of us, our risk perception is our risk reality. Right? We care about a, a whole slew of separate factors than the experts. And that means that experts coming in and shouting numbers at us doesn't tend to change our mind about risk. Uh, and this means that to effectively communicate risk, that requires risk communicators to understand how and why their audience thinks this is risky. Some things are obvious, right? Chernobyl, uh, pretty obvious that that is risky and why people are scared. Other things are less obvious. Uh, and I'll make a plug right now. If you haven't seen the HBO show Chernobyl, it's excellent. I tell people it's about as accurate as it needs to be to still be entertaining. And I can say that I'm a trained nuclear engineer. Uh, so you can take my word for whatever that's worth. All right, so that's risk perception kind of in a nutshell. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit more about how we actually communicate risk. And a lot of this information is going to come from this book, uh, Risk Analysis and Engineering, Tec Techniques, Tools, and Trends by Mohammed Madaris. All right, so why is risk communication important? Well, systems are designed built, operated, maintained by experts, right? People who know what they're doing, who are trained in handling that system. Whether it's the Airbus A320, which is rapidly becoming the plane of choice, uh, or it's Fort St. Vrain, a nuclear power plant. Well, it was a nuclear power plant here in Colorado. It is now a natural gas plant, uh, right? Experts design, build, operate, maintain those, right? But we, fly on the planes, right? We sit on those seats, we get power from Fort St. Grain, we rely on those systems. And we, by doing that, are trusting engineers to act responsibly, right? We don't have the expertise to assess these complex risks. So we'd say, hey, engineers, you know what you're doing, please assess the risks, get back to us if there's something that's wrong. Uh, and that trust is informed by communication. Uh, and further, we communicate risk because in a democracy, the governing power is nominally vested in us, right? We get a say uh, and we understand the needs of our community and deserve a voice in decisions that are going to affect us, right? That's why we, we communicate risk. Uh, and there's some basic rules of risk communication uh, that I think are actually applicable to both uh, the public and the engineers as audience and communicator, right? So the first is accept and involve, I'll say the other side, as a legitimate partner. If you're an expert, the public deserves a voice, right? They live in that community. They have a right to participate in decisions that affect their lives, their property, the things they value. Uh, and if you're in the public, the engineers know what they're talking about and they're not usually malicious, right? So they have your best interests in mind, but they need to know what those interests are. Right, so accepting and involving the other side as a legitimate partner, planning what you're going to say carefully and evaluating how you're saying it and how it's being received. Uh, listen to specific concerns that uh, this one might be more applicable to the experts, but specific concerns that the public is bringing up. Being honest, frank, and open when we're talking with people, coordinating and collaborating with other credible sources. So say if you're managing a pandemic, you listen to what the CDC has to say and you back them up instead of trying uh, to undermine 
And finally, being clear and compassionate, right? Using technical jargon uh, is really just a barrier to successful communication. So let's take a look at how risk communication worked, or rather did not work, uh, in the case of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and if you remember Hurricane Katrina, you know exactly how devastating it was to the city of New Orleans that still 20 years later has not fully recovered. Uh, if you don't remember Hurricane Katrina, uh, thank you to your professor for giving you extra credit to be here. Um, but it was one of the costliest tropical cyclones we've ever recorded. It caused 1,200 fatalities in the city of New Orleans and $125 billion worth of damage. And it was really a somewhat preventable catastrophe. And let's talk about why that is. So the first aspect of risk communication that fails is involving the public. In New Orleans, emergency plans were developed apparently without community input. Their evacuation plans relied heavily on people driving out of the city, which works great until you realize that New Orleans was 80% reliant on public transit. And you can take a look uh, at, I thought the screen would be a little bit bigger, but you can take a look at some of the overlays on the right. Uh, what you see here is the public transit system as it stood in 2005 with kind of red indicating a longer wait time. Uh, and then up here we have a population by the census block map. Uh, and I've highlighted areas of relatively long wait times and high poverty. They overlap as they tend to do in many cities. They didn't really involve the public with this discussion. And actually most discussion of actual risk prior to Katrina came from non-government sources from studies done by Louisiana State University that said a large uh, large storm could destroy New Orleans. <laughs> pretty right. Uh, as well as a series of articles from their newspaper, the New, or New Orleans Times Picayune, that detailed the lack of storm defenses, right? So pre-storm risk communication didn't come from the government and didn't feature any real government community dialogue. And just out of curiosity, does anyone know what Picayune means? It is the worthless squabbling of politicians. And that is their, that is their newspaper, the New Orleans Times Picayune. Uh, but let's move on and see how well they planned what they were going to say and listen to the community. Uh, and turns out they didn't really do this either. Communication with the public before and during Katrina kind of in the run up to landfall and afterwards was scattered and aimless. There were mixed messages from state, city, and parish governments. If you're not familiar with Louisiana, parish is essentially a county. Uh, so different messages come from different levels of government. Uh, and any evacuation recommendations, they were not mandated to evacuate, but evacuations were recommended at the same time as they recommended stockpiling critical supplies. And you don't need to stockpile if you're going to leave. So they said, hey, you should leave, but also you should probably stay. Uh, and if you're going to stay, you should go out and buy bread and milk and whatever else us Southerners buy when there's a storm coming. It's mostly bread and milk for reasons I still don't know. I lived in Georgia for 25 years. I still don't understand that one. Uh, and then there was also a little, very little effort made to engage with their community, right? It's a heavily African-American community that were already underserved by their government and that turns them into reluctant citizens. Uh, there was a state-sponsored program that meant to engage churches as kind of the de facto authorities in these communities to help evacuation efforts and New Orleans didn't take advantage of that. Uh, and particularly residents of the Ninth Ward, which is one of the poorest areas in New Orleans, uh, were essentially abandoned. There were no feasible evacuation plans made for the Ninth Ward. Uh, and in these little blurbs, we have two things. The top is a message from an instructional video. 30,000 of these videos were produced, meant to be distributed to low-income neighborhoods, urging them to leave before official announcements. Those videos were never distributed. The bottom is uh, the evacuation announcement made on the day of landfall uh, that hopes that the hurricane could still move in one direction or the other and miss New Orleans. So if you look at where it made landfall and the distance to New Orleans, there is zero chance of that actually happening. So they didn't really plan their communications. They weren't listening to the community. 
and they were not honest or coordinated in their communication, right? This, this comes at the end of decades of eroded trust in communicators and in the government. So why should we listen to the government now? Right? This leads the public to engage in avoidance strategies. This isn't avoiding the risk, right? This isn't leaving New Orleans and saying, I don't want to be involved when a hurricane hits New Orleans. This is avoiding the issue, right? Saying, well, a hurricanes have hit New Orleans before, we survived then, we'll survive now, it must not be an actual issue. And despite this, there was no real effort to rebuild that credibility in these, communica uh, in these communities. Uh, again, we've seen that communications from different agencies were not coordinated. Uh, and this all leads to about 70,000 residents in the city that don't evacuate. And finally, when we get to the actual response, it really lacks clarity and compassion. Evacuation messages were muddled by technical jargon that people don't need to know. Right? If you're standing on the street in New Orleans, you're looking up at the river. If you don't know, New Orleans is built below grade, so you're looking up at the river, at boats passing by. It doesn't matter to you at that point whether water is going to come over that levee or through that levee. No. All you need to know is that water from over there is going to be where you're at and you should get somewhere else. So using terms like overtopping and breaching and different messages confuses people who just need to know that they should leave. Again, evacuation messages were confusing and issued too late. There were two sent to New Orleans 24 hours before landfall and after the levees had failed. So the city's already flooded. Where are they going to go? That's not an evacuation message. That's, for lack of a better term, an FU to the city. Uh, the actual response really lacked care and compassion. Evacuation buses didn't go into many neighborhoods, particularly not poor neighborhoods. And when people did evacuate, they were evacuated to the Superdome, which is in the city of New Orleans. So they didn't really evacuate. They just went to see not a football game. That's not an evacuation. So we really have to ask the question, could it have gone better? Yep. Yeah, it could have gone better. And there are a couple of issues to overcome here. One is tough to actually address, right? That's apathy reinforced by years of risks failing to materialize. There's not much that we can do about that. Does anyone hear speed while they drive? Oh, come on. Get out of here, I know you all do. But the first time you speed feels a little exhilarating, right? But you don't get caught and nothing bad happens. And what happens? You start speeding more and more. Maybe not higher speeds, but speeding more often. That's what happened on a community level in New Orleans. 30 years of being told the levees would fail, followed by the levees holding, means that the government perspective becomes this must not actually be a risk, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the community perspective becomes we've survived large storms yeah, before, yeah. we'll survive now, it must not actually be a risk. Right? So there's not much we can do about that apathy reinforced by risks failing to materialize, but there is a lot that we could have done about the breakdown of local democracy. This is a community that was basically entirely disconnected and disaffected by their local government. They had a large minority and female population. Those groups tend to have lower trust in the government anyways. And you can see why, right? If I were living in a system that systematically stripped my rights at every opportunity, I also would not trust the government. Segregation was and remains a huge problem in New Orleans with low income neighborhoods neglected by the city. And as a result, you have a population that doesn't trust the government and doesn't engage in the democratic process. And on the other side, you have a city that is not engaged in the democratic process, that is not talking to or listening to the needs of their community. There was no dialogue about storm preparations and defense after earlier storms like Hurricane Betsy in 1965 or Hurricane George in 1998. Uh, and I am very proud of that French pronunciation. I am not French, but I try. <laughs> had they done this, they might have had evacuation plans that actually met their community needs. But again, that didn't happen. And the breakdown of democracy is a huge reason why. So let's talk 
about what democracy has to actually do with risk. There's a critical mediator or uh, intermediary between democracy and risk, and that is trust. Our trust in the system and the technology and who is running those systems informs how risky we think that enterprise actually is. And our trust in the government, in democratic institutions, and in democratic principles informs how engaged we're willing to be within a democracy. So trust is necessary to both of these things. And as we saw, the breakdown of that democratic process in New Orleans actually exacerbated the risk that that community was under, right? It actively increased the risk of people getting hurt and dying because of hurricanes. And further, that continuous exposure to risk without mitigation, and I'm not talking here just hurricane risk, also socioeconomic risk induced by essentially government neglect, eroded the, dem the democracy in New Orleans, right? So risk can erode democracy and a breakdown of democracy can exacerbate our risk. It's a vicious cycle. Uh, and it turns out that this is somewhat unique in the United States. The com as Paul Slovic, who's one of the founding fathers of the psychometric theory of risk perception notes, uh, a lot of the controversies we have surrounding risk management are a side effect of how we run our democracy in the US. Public input, especially on things like infrastructure and infrastructure risk, is somewhat unique to our system, right? We have a very individualistic tradition in the United States. And so we see this as respecting the autonomy of smaller communities and individuals, even though it complicates basically every infrastructure decision uh, and project we try to do. Uh, and we can see some examples of this uh, and the differences between the nuclear industries in France and the United States. Both countries have similar levels of anti-nuclear fear and bias, but the French get 80% of their power from nuclear power. And a lot of that has to do with the government-run nature of their nuclear industry, right? The French trust their government until they, as my wife pointed out last night, until they don't and set things on fire, and then they start to trust their government a little bit more. Right In the United States, we don't necessarily have that trust in, say, the nuclear industry, right? In Excel, in GE, in Southern Company, in whatever the case may be. And our experiences with risk, as we saw in New Orleans, tend to erode our trust, whether that is economic or social risk, such as the Great Recession or COVID-19, that started to massively erode public trust in the government, or it's engineering risk, like Three Mile Island or the Boeing 737 MAX slash everything that's going on right now that tends to erode our trust in the industry. And this is a huge problem because trust is what we'll call asymmetrical, right? It's And this, is, this extends to people-to-people -people interactions as well. It's way easier to destroy trust than it is to build it. Right? Trust destroying events are often more visible, right? We see the accidents, we see the meltdowns, we see the storms, we see the pandemics, we don't see the near misses. We don't necessarily hear about the next pandemic that was stopped in its, foot, uh, in its footsteps by the CDC. Uh, and they carry more weight than trust building events, and that's somewhat evolutionary, right? It's a lot safer for you to be running away from negative things and to avoid negative things than it is necessarily to run towards positive things. So our caveman brain does a little trick on us where it remembers negative events much more than positive events. Uh, and so we have to ask the question, right, if all this is true, if our perception really guides us this much, should how we feel about risk, should our perception affect how we manage risk. And there's two broad views that I'll, you might even call extreme views on this point. The first says no. And the second extreme view says yes. Uh, and so we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail, but suffice to say the negative view on this point is paternalistic, right? We need to base our decisions on facts alone, separate them from value, and it is also backed heavily by the psychometric theory of risk perception. The second view uh, views risks as more of a social construct, 
Uh, and so it is backed by the social cultural theory of risk perception that you know assumes our perception is based more on our adherence to a specific worldview uh, than on really any intricacies of our own personality. So let's take a look at this first, the paternalistic view uh, that advocates for an outsized role uh, for experts and cost benefit analysis and risk decisions. They say the public is too reliant on these rapid, intuitive, and error-prone system one cognitive processes, but experts are way more deliberative. They're slower. Uh, they're likely to be error-free. And as a result, we should insulate our experts as much as possible from public fears and debates. And they see cost-benefit analysis as a kind of correcting factor for the public's cognitive biases. Right, we could assess risks unbiased by these divisive social or moral issues. For example, looking at the risks actually associated with, say, stem cell research without engaging in a public fight over what the meaning or the value of a human life is and whether stem cells qualify as human life. And that's these points are great, right? We want that kind of science backed, rigorous assessment of risks that actually affect us. It would be nice to actually engage in risk dis discussions without pulling morals or ethics into it at every turn. But there's some problems with this, namely that if I pulled the room, and we got some sort of average conclusion on you know, what the most risky thing that we experience is, it might not necessarily align with each of our individual conclusions, right? So we're leaving some people out in the cold here. Uh, the second problem is experts, and this may be a shock, experts are people. That we're not immune to biases. We're not immune to using heuristics. At the end of the day, we're still people. We have the same biases as the public. Uh, and the last point, which is a bit of a philosophical question, is it ethical to remove someone's agency from a type of decision that will affect their lives and well-being and might actually endanger them? Uh, I am not a philosopher or an ethicist, so I can't really answer that question. Uh, but I'll leave it for you to ponder on. And the opposite of this view says the public is really more engaged in questioning than scientists give them credit for. And further, that science as an institution tends to lack self-critical reflection and finding our limits. I think we can all think of maybe a scientist or engineer who hit the public light and decided that his, yep, it's his, uh, his voice deserves to be applied to every field of human endeavors. Uh, so we tend to lack finding our own limits, uh, as well as we tend to frame risks more narrowly than the public, right? We already saw that. We look at probabilities and consequences and the public looks at everything else. Uh, further, the public is more, motiva more motivated by things other than the numbers, right? That trust, the morality, the distribution of consequences, et cetera. And they're advocating not to do away with risk assessment, but for more upstream engagement between experts and the public so that we can address aspects of risk that are important to the public before we do a project. And that the public has some chance to scrutinize the practice of risk assessment uh, and come to some sort of normative consensus on whether or not we're doing it right. And that's great, right? We want the public to be involved in decisions that affect their lives we do want science to be this open institution that is necessarily subject to scrutiny. That's kind of the whole point. Uh, but there's some problems with this as well. Uh, namely, whether or not this would actually account for the public opinion or just the loudest opinion. And you can turn to any number of recent events uh, as to whether or not you think that would happen. Uh, the social cultural theory of risk perception is a bit weaker. Uh, and it's an experimental support than the psychometric theory of risk perception. Uh, and finally, another philosophical question. How do we account for differing social and cultural values in a large heterogeneous public? Uh, and if you know the answer to that question, I believe the Nobel Peace Prize office is just across the hallway and you can pick it up on your way out, right? It's a tough question that every society around the world pretty much is still grappling with. Right? So both sides have these tough questions to answer. They're not perfect. Uh, and so what are we going to do? Well, my novel idea is that we're going to meet somewhere in the middle, right? With 
this idea for a normative framework for risk management that sets out what ought to be done, right, in a perfect world rather than specifying specific courses of action that allows for flexibility, right? So this can actually be implemented in practice. And again, the goal here is to improve trust between people and the experts, not to persuade the public that risks aren't real or you're being a crybaby or whatever the case may be. And that means that we both have to be willing to see the other side uh, and to come to the table. And the whole point here is that as we improve or increase the visibility of processes and technologies, we see an increase in people's trust in that technology, right? AI, a little bit scary because you don't know what's going on on the inside. I teach here. I don't really know what's going on in the inside of a lot of large language models. That's not my field of expertise. So I'm a little bit skeptical. As we get more visibility into these processes, our skepticism starts to go down. The problem with risk management is that as you do that, as we make the process more visible, we're spending a lot more time and resources to engage with the public. Right? So we can't really afford to be on one end or the other. At one end, no one trusts us uh, and thinks that we're all out to get them. At the other end, we bankrupt every institution trying uh, to implement new projects. So we meet somewhere in the middle uh, so that everybody's upset. Nobody's really happy, but it works, <laughs> right? Uh, and the inspiration for this idea comes from a number of different things. Uh, state medical boards that oversee the practice of medicine in each state are usually required to have non-expert members. Right, someone who's not a doctor who can come in and say, that doesn't seem right. Like I'm not a doctor, but that arm is supposed to be here, not here. Uh, as well as this, the Colorado Chemical Demilitarization Citizens Advisory Commission, or CAC, that's been set up in Pueblo. These have been implemented in every state that has a chemical weapons stockpile. Uh, so if you're from Pueblo, that's what that's holding. Uh, it's being mediated or remediated now. Uh, and in Pueblo, it's a team of seven community members, people from Pueblo that live there, uh, as well as two state appointed officials that hold monthly public meetings with the US Army uh, to talk about what's going on at the Pueblo Chemical Depot to address risks that the community have brought forward uh, and to learn where they go from here. And there's a lot of good about this setup. This is excellent public engagement with community risk. So far, both the community and the US Army have appeared very willing to hear the other side out, to come to the table. And most importantly, I would argue, these are locally appointed members, right? People from the community, rather than just another outside expert or an outside person coming in to tell the community what to do. There's some not so good uh, namely, there seems to be limited expertise in risk psychology, so you I tend to question how good the risk communication actually is back to the community, and they, the authority to actually direct anything at the PCD seems unclear. But again, it seems like this works for Pueblo, and that, I think, is the most important thing about this, is that it works for the community, right? And so this sets up this kind of normative framework uh, for democratic risk management, again, with the goal of allowing this public engagement with risk-relevant decisions on what will likely be mostly infrastructure projects, right? So we could have a start rule. Right? This doesn't have to be every risk. Again, risks lower than one in a million per year are generally invisible to most of us. They're active God levels. And so we say, well, maybe once we get to a risk that's above that level, we start to engage the community, and we do so with that citizens advisory committee that takes some of the communication burden off of the experts who are busy doing most of the risk assessment. It doesn't burden the advisory committee with the details of doing the risk assessment, although they should have some active role in there, and it gives the public agency in their own community. And I think that this would go a long way towards improving our communities. And I see some immediate benefits here. Namely, it's a pathway for communities to raise and address their concerns. Uh, it allows communities to understand risk, right? And what mitigation actions are being taken in their name. 
And finally, uh, again, it can improves their agency in their own community, right? Gives them a say. Uh, I also think there are some long-term benefits to this approach, namely that this could help us develop incentive mechanisms, right? We have to put these infrastructure somewhere. It's gotta go somewhere. It's gotta be somewhere that's relatively accessible. Uh, so how can we work with communities to assume these risks? And the DOE is embarking on two projects that are aimed at exactly this. The first is their consent-based siting for nuclear waste storage. So working with communities to see what it would take to get a community to host a nuclear waste repository in their community. Uh, probably a lot more than the DOE was hoping uh, it took, but it's a great way of working with communities to talk about what the benefits of this infrastructure would be to their community, as well as a DOE uh, slash Idaho National Labs consortium working on the just transition to a green economy uh, part of that transition requires shutting down coal plants. But for a lot of communities, the coal plant is their employer. It's what allows them to be a community. And so instead of shutting it down and saying, best of luck, you know, so long, thanks for all the fish, go find something else to do. What we're saying is, hey, we actually have an opportunity here to bring these communities along with us in the just transition by converting those coal sites to nuclear power plants. So you convert a coal power plant to say solar or wind, you still lose a lot of jobs. You don't need as many engineers or as many trained professionals to operate solar and wind farms uh, as you do for coal plants. But for nuclear power plants, you actually need more than your typical coal plant. And so we're not only keeping the jobs that are already there, but we're increasing the number of jobs, maybe even growing these communities. And I think the bigger benefit here is that we could really reverse the cycle where underserved communities are shouldering more and more of our infrastructure risk. This is what I call consequence localization. Right? You build a power plant somewhere, that power goes, say, all across the state of Colorado. But only the people living near the power plant have to deal with it when something goes wrong. And more often than not, the communities that have to deal with it are already underserved and neglected. And so I think that by doing this, by engaging these communities, we might be able to stop that cycle, to stop the inequitable distribution of consequences and benefits. And so in summary, yeah, you're done. Congratulations, you made it. Uh, the public deserves a voice in decisions that affect our lives. The only way we accomplish that is with risk communication. We saw two kind of distinct frameworks for incorporating democracy and risk. Uh, and my brand new awesome idea is to meet in the middle, uh, to uh, pursue this kind of blended normative framework uh, that gives the public appropriate agency without bogging down all of our processes to no end. Uh, but this requires us to get involved. So if you thought you made it, you didn't, sorry. There's one more slide. It's just this, right? We have to get involved as people. Uh, functioning democracies and our risk decisions rely on an informed and engaged public. And so we get involved with democracy the same way we get involved with risk. First, by educating ourselves, right? What are the issues that we're concerned about? Knowing the democratic processes, knowing the risk management processes, and knowing the candidates that we do or do not want to vote for. We involve ourselves by paying attention to state, local, national, political scenes and infrastructure issues in our area, right? If you don't like that new Bucky's, should have you should have spoken up, right? Should have gotten involved. Uh, you're wrong. Bucky's is great. Uh, it, it's from the south, like me. It's awesome. Uh, if you don't like a hundred plus gas pumps at one station, then you just don't like gas. Sorry to tell you. Um, their food is actually legitimately like pretty good for a gas station. So I'll say that. Um, so involving ourselves in what's happening in our area, what's happening in our country, and communicating our concerns and interests, right? Principally to lawmakers. Uh, and the way we do that is we got to vote. I don't care. Well, I do care. And personally, who you vote for, you sh it doesn't matter what I think, right? If you are concerned about something, you make your concern known by voting. It's an election year. Get out and vote. If you haven't registered, register. Get out and vote in November, uh, and that's it. So I'll take questions now. Oh, but before I do, 
please be sure to catch the closing keynote. Dr. Robert Putnam is a fantastic author and scholar. He'll be talking about the decline of communities, what that means for democracy, and a little bit of an upswing that might be on the horizon. So thank you very much. I'll take any questions. Yes. Well, uh, him first, and then I'll get to you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this whole framework relies on good faith actions. Yep. So, I'm taking bad faith actions these days. How does that play? Is there a risk mitigation? Is there a risk mitigation right. strategy for the risk mitigation strategy? Yes. It's a really, really good question. There is, I would, I would agree that there is definitely an upswing in bad faith actors. Uh, and I think that that is where the federal government and regulatory agencies need to take charge is that they are the ones who are regulating these industries, nominally at least, right? Maybe the FAA a little bit different because they're kind of in cahoots with some of the companies, but that's where that's where regulatory agencies have to step up and create guidelines for not only acting in good faith, but also addressing bad faith acting. But yeah, excellent point because yeah, it does rely on people being honest and acting honestly. Yeah. Yes, sir. Any thoughts on the train derailment in East Palestine? On the train derailment in East Palestine, horrific risk communication. If that's gonna, if that's, if that's your plan, thank you. Uh, if if your plan to clean that up is to burn it off, that is certainly a strategy that you can engage in. And they obviously did engage in, but you can't do that while you leave the public in place. And you can't do that without compensating the public for the fact that they might not ever live there safely again. So my thoughts are, you gotta be kidding me. That, that's, that's my thoughts. I, I don't have anything more eloquent to say than that. <laughs> like you cannot be serious. Fair yeah. enough. Yes. Regarding uh, your, your framework for risk analysis, what would you call this idea that you have, this this, uh, like, this combining of what the analyst does and what this very view? I think, uh, I, have, I haven't thought about what I would call it. I Something, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, an, H, an HOA. <laughs> uh, that, that's a really good question. I haven't really thought about what it would be. I think maybe, I hate to do, I, I hate acronyms because my field, well, all of our fields are full of seemingly useless acronyms, but it would probably be something like a partially paternalistic framework or something. Yeah. But because it's a good question. It's super important, you know, you know so I, I'm trying to kind of get the policy side that really doesn't often care about science and mm -hmm. expertise with the system and create a risk management uh, process that pulls those two together. Oh, the language. okay. What you talked about today is very appropriate to what I'm doing, and I I find like using a bow tie method or mm -hmm. something like that. I have and, a bow tie diagram yeah. tattooed right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's very appropriate for both, mm -hmm. although it's not usually utilized in policy. But I think the framework that you brought today is through the way. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that you're working on that as well, because I think that's that's critical. That's that's how we improve, you know, the the process of risk management, the democratic processes. I think you know I don't want to over like overblow the impacts, but I, I think this could be huge, huge for the world. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. No, thank you. How have you improved communication around with that aren't salient, like air quality? Toxic, radon, or like microplastic, some of those things that you want? Oh, that's a really good question. So, I think a big thing for risk communication is appropriately addressing uncertainties, as well as trying to put some um, relative values towards that. People tend to respond well when we can frame a specific risk in terms of something that they already know. Right, so something related to you know like smoking. We know smoking causes cancer. Well, we know that now. We didn't. We we intentionally did not know that for a long time, but we know that now. 
Um, so I think framing those risks uh, in relation to something that is more visible to people is a great idea. Appropriately discussing uncertainties, right? It's people need to know when we aren't quite sure of something, uh, and that I think improves their understanding when we are pretty sure, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, especially with regards to say forever chemicals in the water, like we know that that's going to be a bad time for a lot of people. So I think the biggest thing would be to frame those risks in terms that people already know and are familiar with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Help moving the stems back up. There. Uh, yeah, I think we'll get it. Yeah, right. thank you. You're offering it this fall, right? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Mostly online, but probably not.